Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Sam Manger. I'm a GP and academic lead for the Genshin University postgraduate courses in lifestyle medicine. And today I'm gonna to have a little chat to our friend, Kim Pointer, who is a practice nurse and health coach. So thanks for joining me, Kim. Very, very welcome. And hello everyone. I'm really excited to be discussing these topics with you today, Sam. Yeah, great. So let's just start with the basics. You know, what is lifestyle medicine to you? Well, lifestyle medicine is what I live and breathe because of, you know, the matriarchs that I've had in my life. So my grandma lived to a hearty age of 108 and she lived and breathed this methodology, right? So she gardened, she stayed fit and strong, she was agile, she was on no medications and it was because she just kept that lifestyle going always. So it wasn't something she did sometimes. She made sure that she showed up every single day and did that. And I just have obviously had that emulated to me. So, of course, it's a priority for me to continue to do that. If I'm going to have that kind of, you know, genetic background behind me, I want to make sure that I have the quality of life that she had. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, so I wonder how, how has it impacted your professional practice and career? Because as you say, you live and breathe this stuff both personally and professionally. Yeah, for sure. So um, fortunately for me, I have a passion for chronic disease management. And I have a passion, obviously, for engaging people that, you know, might find it challenging to make these lifestyle choices for themselves. And so I, that's why I took on health coaching. Because for me, I just went, how do I engage the disengaged and then empower them, elicit motivation to take practical next steps for them? And so the game changer for me, Sam, particularly was when I started to talk about what does quality of life mean for them? What does thriving rather than surviving mean for them? Mm. What is it that they practically and tangibly can do that's 1% more than what they're currently doing? Mm. So embedding that into my usual language when I'm doing care planning, chronic disease management, self-managed agreed goals, looking at SNAP guidelines, so the preventative stuff, but also health assessments, right? Starting really early at that, you know, inception of doing heart health checks, doing, you know, refugee checks, doing things right at that 40 year old onwards check. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I feel that we've got such an opportunity always to be talking mm -hmm. about these things, but breaking it down so it's not jargonistic, breaking it down so it's a conversation human to human and saying, what do you want for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And it, as you say, it's sort of applicable to everyone, isn't it? And it's whether it's yeah. prevention or treatment, it's applicable at all stages for all conditions. It's never going to hurt. It's probably always going to help. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And seeing people take those next steps. You know, mm -hmm. I was a telehealth nurse during the COVID lockdown for a practice. And the GPs were saying to me, how are you getting these patients who have never done anything? They always say, oh, I'm doing everything that I can. You know, that, that resistiveness, because mm -hmm. they feel like that we're talking about a major overhaul of their life. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let's just break it down to 1% more, right? Yeah. And then people are like, well, I could do that. Yeah. And so then watching them build efficacy, the belief that change is possible for them versus going, all right, let's get you that prescription approach of you must be this weight range, you know, all of our RSAGEP clinical guidelines, you know, making sure that we're putting it into practical, practical terms of, you know, what does it mean for you? And I've got an example of that, Sam, for you. Mm, please. I had a, a lady come into me and she's like, don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, we can hear the, you know, the, that resistance already. Don't yeah. tell me. And I found that often with care planning, people would, would think that they had to justify, right, why they weren't doing those top healthful behaviours. Don't you tell me that I need to exercise. I know I need to lose weight, but I'm not going to stop eating the beautiful food that I do. She loved dining out. She was very social. And I'm not going to exercise. <laughs> and I said to her, well, talk to me about a time that you really enjoyed exercise. And she's going, well, I don't like swimming. So she's still on that defensive. Yeah. yeah. I don't like swimming because all my friends are there and they're in their bathers and I don't want to be seen in my bathers. All this dialogue came out. I said, was there a period of time where you enjoyed moving your body? Right. Mm. Let's take away that even that word exercise, moving mm. your body. What did you do? 
And she said, well, there was a time, there was a time when I was traveling through India and I got into belly dancing and at home, I've still got all my belly dancing outfits. And I said, well, is that something that you might want to engage in again? Like, it sounds like you've kept the costumes for maybe a one day, right? Mm-hmm. They probably wouldn't have that in our community. I said, well, do you want to look like and see if we do have it in our community? Sure enough, we had it in our community. Yeah. So yeah. again, not being rigid and having an attachment to an agenda as a clinician, me just finding out and unpacking what's going to make bring her joy yeah. An activity that she knows has worked in the past that she's got enjoyments, obviously going to mean that she's more likely to go and do it. So her verbally persuading herself is much more likely that she's actually going to undertake something versus just say, oh, yeah, I'll give it a go. And you know that she's not quite ready just yet. Yeah. And a, another client, he um, same sort of thing, that resistive language was coming up and he said to me, you know, oh, I'm really overweight. I've been overweight for years and years and years. Like nothing I do will ever, you know, change that. And he said, I've tried everything. Now, again, coming back to metaphors, right? He had told me that he loves to garden. And I said to him, do you know that you've got a garden in your, in your stomach? And he said, really? And I said, yeah, you've got a garden in your stomach. And then when we give it a variety of different things, like your garden, you know, it starts to do good things for our health and well-being. And he's like, wow. So that, that discussion only was a snapshot, right? Yeah. Cool. He went yeah. home and did all of this research on his gut garden. Mm-hmm. And he came back and he said, I'm so impressed that you tapped into something that I'm passionate about, he said, because I understand now Mm. what I can do that's going to assist me to be healthier. Yeah. So again, just coming back to what do you know about that client, using your open-ended questions to find out more about them so you can engage them from, you know, maybe a metaphor or maybe a perspective that they're going to latch onto and go and research, do their own research Mm. and verbally persuade themselves. Yeah, I love it. And that, you know, the lifestyle medicine, which uh, to me, health coaching is, is, is an essential part of this approach, which is obviously why it's a subject and the, um, because it is personalizing, it's creative, it's connecting people of the relevance and making it engaging as opposed to taking it from a prescriptive sense, you know, Mm. which is didactic and boring and um, cold and sterile to this sort of, you know, warm, relevant, vitality sort of sense that people get a sense of and then they want to keep going down that road I wonder you mentioned the response of your colleagues you know in the GP you work in primary care obviously and you know and you work in chronic disease management is a key part of your role and so how how's the response or how's how's the actual the primary care or your the response from your colleagues been and has, has there been a bit of a shift yeah absolutely so initially when we embedded the the health coaching into our model of care And obviously it was a passion of mine to to do that. The GP's response was, again, with that telehealth, the GP's coming back to me going, how did you get them to do something? Like we Mm. always have this, you know, I want you to try this, try that. And they're just like, yes, yes, yes. Or no, no, no. (laughs) Or I'll try, right? But then never the action. We also had, you know, the health coaching where I, I was working. They said, let's give it a go and we'll see what the engagement with the, you know, the changes with the client's health and well-being is and the engagement with having a health coach in our team is, particularly for those complex need clients. Mm. Within five months, I had a five-week wait and I had to say to them, can we train more coaches because Mm. there's so much of a demand. Now, it wasn't necessarily the demand from the clinician's referrals. It was the patient referrals and the clinicians were going, wow, the feedback that we're receiving from these patients about the changes they're making, Mm. the positive feelings that they're having as a consequence of making those changes, and then for them to go and say, hey, you know, I tried this, why don't you give this a go? They were really, really, um, I think, grateful that they had somewhere to refer patients to, team-based care, right? So it allows you as a team to really have a skill 
set in amongst your team that you can go, yeah. hey, I can refer her to, I can refer to Kim and it's not going to be just dietetics or just exercise or just, it's going to be holistic yes. and it's going to be about what's going to enable that person to thrive. And I think when the GPs particularly can see, you know, firstly, they see quality of life discussion changes, they see well-being positive emotions being displayed but then they see the biometrics right mm. so we get to the biometrics after those initial things happen but once they start to see things trend down like cholesterols like weights like blood pressures as a consequence of people making lifestyle changes mm. that's good for everyone means that they're they're enjoying their role so much more mm. And their interactions with that client is just so much more enhanced as well because that client's, you know, taking positive steps to, to their health and well-being. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a win, 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 isn't it? Because the, obviously the, the, the patient, the client is, you know, managing slash reversing slash conditions, but also just improving their overall well-being and feeling more, as we said, sort of vitality because of that. that. That improves their response and their relationship with the health service itself because they feel like their needs are being met. And then you've got, as you said, the actual... Have you noticed with your that you, since taking this on, and obviously you've been a health coach for some years now, but have you when, when you sort of made that shift, did you feel your personal enjoyment of the job in, in hand? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because it was less of, okay, I'm just going to see this client. They're going to say to me, here's all the justifications and excuses on why I can't do those things that you want me to do. Okay. So I would say, okay, from a literacy perspective, these are the things that I'd like you to do yeah. because of your yeah. chronic condition. And then they'd go, yeah, I know all that. Right. And then I'd go, well, what other tool can I pull out of my toolkit because I've just given you all my tools, which is literacy, right? And yeah. I've come from intensive care and we are all about that. It's a, a different setting. It's very much that we have to be in that expert role. But behaviour change and engaging someone in their health and wellbeing needs something else. Mm -hmm. And that, that's where the change came for me. And I went, I have so many tools in my toolkit. So come and come and share what it, where you're at in terms of your readiness for change and I'll, instead of me trying to get you to make changes in an area that you're pre-contemplative and contemplating for and you might be two years or six months away I actually can look at another behavior if I'm flexible enough mm. that you're actually ready to take steps on and change that particular behavior and it might be sleep it might be stress it might be social connection it may be getting out and doing something really good for your mental well-being mm. once we foster that you know that's when they start to make changes in all those other things that we want as clinicians right for them to make changes in but we just have to go to a stage of readiness to understand that and that's when I went I've got all the tools in my toolkit right let's go and start to really see changes in people and just you know championing another human being yeah. versus cheerleading yeah means that when things aren't necessarily because we it's part of life right we can make changes we have relapses and we have lapses and we until we get it in our bones and our habitual yeah. structure we that's normal and so for me normalizing that and they go oh thank goodness now I don't have to avoid Kim when I see her in the supermarket because I haven't <laughs> been doing what I verbalized I would yeah. do now I know that I can show up and she just goes yeah hey that's normal Let's work through that and find out what bits do we need to add on so we can customise it to your lifestyle. And just working it through, having that facilitated discussion means that they go, it's okay to fail, right? Because we're failing forward. Mm -hmm. Failing forward, I like that. The, um, and, you know, learning as we go, and that's just life, isn't it? And, and there's a real, um, there's a real authenticity there. I think it allows people to be real and then um and, and that that is like it could be a real relationship as well it's not just again this sort of let's pretend that things are okay or be this prescriptive style and i love the analogy of the tool i often say the same thing about you know if all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail but if you expand your toolbox then you can do so many more jobs and you know so many more fine details so that's that's wonderful and i fully agree 
All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time, Kim. That was so valuable. And it's so lovely to hear from your perspective about how you know, lifestyle medicine, health coaching has sort of enhanced your outcomes and your career and your personal satisfaction and, and all that sort of stuff. It's wonderful to hear. So thanks again. No worries at all. Thanks for having me.